it's very difficult to find ag assets unless you just invest in stock market, you know, the John Deere's, the, the REITs, you know, they're all publicly traded assets predominantly. And, and the problem is if you start investing in the same publicly traded assets in a different asset class, you're just going to have the same cyclical downturns, upturns and roller coaster that Wall Street gives. Um, so really, yeah, Farmfolio is there to give um, people the ability to buy high demand crops, limes, coconuts, um, avocados, stuff that you buy in the grocery store in the US and Europe. Um, and, and that's the goal there is to, is to feed the world and feed people's um, wealth profile. I've pivoted to hard assets, but more importantly, the hard assets at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of need. What's going on, everybody? This is your host, Chris Noggle, and welcome back to the show. I have been so excited for this podcast episode. As a matter of fact, me and Peter had this scheduled, but then just because of some craziness going on and some traveling, we had to postpone it. And here we are. And I'm with Peter Badger from Farmfolio. I, I, I couldn't be more honored to have you on, Peter. Thanks for joining me. No, Chris, thanks for taking the time. It's a pleasure to be here. You know, one of the things that I want to get into today is just a little bit about what your company does. Uh, you know, there's very rare times, you know, I bring a lot of people on here, real estate investors, syndicators, you know, and they all have great opportunities for people to make money, but very few of them solve a really, really big problem. I mean, not that housing isn't a big problem, but it's not as big of a problem as food and is, is one of those things. Because without food, nothing exists. And it, it is something right now with where we're at in the economy and in the world where there very well might be some food shortages, but you solve two problems. You give people an opportunity to invest in, you know, different agricultural and different things that you do through farm folio, but you also, so they can make money on that, but you're also solving a much bigger thing. And, and Peter, the other cool part is, is we both spend some time in that thing that thing we call Wall Street, you know, you got me by two years on that, but uh, either of us probably have war stories that we could talk about that we probably just keep uh, to those dark places that we never want to go back to. So, That's Peter, right. just tell everybody a little bit about Farmfolio and what you do, and then let's let's take a trip back in history and talk a little bit about your old days and how you transitioned. Yeah, so uh, Farmfolio actually, um, the company was founded in 2015, and its, it's real design was to actually give people the ability to invest in agricultural assets. Uh, because as we know, it's very difficult to find ag assets unless you just invest in stock market, you know, the John Deere's, the, the REITs, you know, they're all publicly traded assets predominantly. And, and the problem is if you start investing in the same publicly traded assets in a different asset class, you're just going to have the same cyclical downturns, upturns, and roller coaster that Wall Street gives. Um, so, really, yeah, Farmfolio is there to give um, people the ability to buy high demand crops, limes, coconuts, um, avocados, stuff that you buy in the grocery store in the US and Europe. Um, and, and that's the goal there is to, is to feed the world and feed people's um, wealth profile. See, and that's just beautiful because it's very different than pretty much anything else I've ever had the discussion about when it comes to investing because of the, the purpose, you know, the yeah. need that it solves is just so much grander than investing in this flip or investing in this syndication or this private fund. I mean, or, or mutual funds, gosh, I don't even like talking about those anymore, but yeah. that wasn't always the case for you. You know, you weren't always on such a unbelievable mission in solving this huge problem. You used to, do the same problem that, you know, all the other advisors like myself and so many others used to do. So let's take a trip back in time to those old days and what that was like, as you spent some time in some major firms, but then I want to really focus on like, where did you draw the line where you decided I'm not really into this anymore and I'm going to transition into this side. Can we just go back in time? Yeah. So I think, um, you know, I, I spent 18 years on Wall Street. In investment banking. I mean, I was a tech guy, but ironically, you know, I was supporting businesses, sales, trading, research, investment banking directly, custody, prime brokerage. I saw all angles of the Wall Street business over 18 years. And I'm very grateful for it. Lived around the world, um, paid very well. Uh, and, and I think for me, 18 years in the same area, and you kind of, you get promoted <laughs> 
more and more and you become an administrator and you end up and rather than like you know doing the core business itself you're an administrator and everybody's gone through their career 15 20 years in and you know five days a week 12 hours a day of meetings and the politics and you know you, at some point i had to escape and do something entrepreneurial and that was really where i got to and ironically chris you'll appreciate this i quit two weeks before the um lehman failure in 2008 was it so, was it coincidence did you see the writing on the wall like some did well, so we knew it was coming, all right? I mean, 2007, we knew it was coming because we sat there at Barclays, Global Investors at the time, and I was trying to value CDO and CDO squared portfolios. And Couldn't you know, value them, could you? Well, when my French quants are confused about CDO squared and then <laughs> Goldman's trying to convince us to buy CDO cubed, you, you think, you know, at some point <laughs> um, enough's enough. So I, I was just, it was a combination of, you know, being a bit sick of it. And um, I was in, you know, Silicon Valley, you know, San Francisco area. That's where Barclays are headquartered. And I was offered angel funding by some neighbors. They're like, Peter, I'm sick of you talking about starting your own business. I'll give you the money. Go ahead and do it you know, start, start acting. And, uh, I quit. And then two weeks later, Lehman failed. Um, we saw one of the biggest, you know, dearths of angel funding, you know, VC capital, everyone's triaging their funds. Cause what people don't realize is, um, you know, the, the big things that happen in downturn is credit titans. Yeah. So it impacts, you know, the average person, uh, you can't get mortgages, you know, the usual story. More importantly, on the business side, it times for businesses and especially for investment. And so you, you'll find that VC funds, uh, they're all kind of triaging. Okay, I've got 30 companies, these four winners, let's throw the money towards them, let's cut these 12. I mean, it's a mess. And I was trying to build a brand new tech company in Silicon Valley as that was playing out. Wow. That I mean, number one, good good for you to get out before that. See, I, I didn't. And the company I was with, although we, we knew something inherently was wrong, the consultants constantly just kept shoving it down our throat that it was going to be okay. And, you know, I, I witnessed the fallout of 2008. And a lot of people don't really know it. I'm sure you do. I mean, how close the entire financial system was to complete an utter failure. A lot of people think, oh, they, you know, that was all fine. It was just another recession. No, no, that was probably the closest we've ever come to a complete failure. And, you know, to the powers that be, they did some things right. Um, hard decisions were made and, and they did, you know, save it, although they saved it at uh, a big loss for most families. I mean, people lost their jobs, their houses, their, their livelihoods, uh, and much more. And unfortunately, that's just, that's the aftermath of what happens during a, a heavy recessionary period. And you left right before that. So you looked at it from the outside, not the inside, where I looked at it from the inside going, oh, my gosh, you know, I didn't even know what to do. I uh, didn't know who to get advice from. And unfortunately, we all just wrote it down. But then you were starting your own company during this. What was that like? I mean, I don't know that side of it well, to start well, a company I mean, during so, this. So let's start with the downturn. Um, we are still paying for the global financial crisis today. 100%. And it's going to double this next recession in how much it hurts the average person um, because we can't bring interest rates down. I mean, there's no movement anywhere. They're only going up. That will cause the mass recession, the money printing pandemic. And it is actually a, a fascinating study um, in what's happened in the past 13, 14 years. And uh, I... I I'm not a big um, doom mongerer. I don't peddle doom for profit. We see many people doing that. Mm -hmm. um, I think we will come out of it. And I'm hoping in the similar to 2008, we come out of this next cycle stronger, smarter, and, and hopefully things will reset a little bit uh, to start building from a, a sounder foundation. It has to come down to create a sound foundation to then start growing again. Yeah, it's it's too far gone right now. Like you mentioned, you know, all the things we're seeing today are are just still the the wake of 2008 and a lot of the things that happened. And we never really came back from that. I mean, 
you can call Japan out as a, a test yeah. pilot with the low interest rate cycle. They, they truly never recovered from what they did. And hopefully we learn from that, but I don't know. I mean, I'm not a doomsdayer, but I certainly might be more of the, the person that says this isn't going to end well. They keep talking soft landing. I don't think the Fed you know, really knows how to soft land this thing. I think this plane's coming in head first and boy, if they get all the wheels on the ground, I'd be really surprised. We got the trifecta happening. You got the Fed drop, rising interest rates seven times, so they say, in 2022. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, they got to curb inflation. If that's really why you think the Fed's raising rates, you really need to study history a little bit more because it's because they need to get those interest rates up because they see what's coming and they need the lever to pull again. And then not only that, the Fed doing this unwinding of the balance sheet. I know they've got about $8.9 trillion of bonds and, and mortgage-backed securities that they're going to start selling. And I've heard rumors of 50 billion a month and so on and so forth. You know, they they can print all the money they want, but just as fast as they print it, they can suck it back out. I always reference back, do you ever see the movie uh, Spaceballs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You remember, remember when Helmet and his big ship roll up to that planet that they, it was Earth, but they didn't call it Earth and their ship turned into a maid, put the vacuum cleaner on the Earth and sucked all the air out. That to me is the closest like visualization of what the Fed unwinding their balance sheet looks like. It's the Fed rolling up to the markets and putting their vacuum cleaner on and just sucking out all the money that they just infused into it. So, and the other thing, if you look back in history, like every time the Fed's done this, except for one time, it has always landed in a, a hard landing or a recessionary period. I tell my friends that with your analogy that um, this economy right now is the Boeing 737 MAX. <laughs> And, that's that's you know, even more one, frightening. One wrong button, and it'll be a very hard landing. So, yeah. no, so, so I think I think the funny thing for me was, you know, I, I I was in the Wall Street bubble like you, Chris, and we you know drank the Kool Aid. We believed our marketing. You know, you can sit in the bubble and believe you're doing for the corporate good, and you are. You're originating loans, and you're you know you're creating the economy in reality. But there's also a lot of let's call it more nefarious. Um, derivatives, you know, proprietary trading. There's a whole slew of business I go on for hours that are more about making money for the big banks than they are about creating a robust financial economy. Um, and so to me, I was kind of a little bit, um, let's say, uh, jaded as I saw it crash. I got out just at the right time. It was more, you know, it wasn't necessarily uh, by design. Uh, it was a life stage I was into. And I started my company. And, and the thing is, the great thing about building a company, and this is really important for entrepreneurs listening, and this is about to become this time again, you should build your company over the two or three year period, if you can, when the crash is happening. Because everybody has their hair on fire. They are catatonic. They are stood rigid, not knowing whether to turn left, right, or put their head at their rear end. And you have the opportunity to get out there, build, innovate, ignore the noise in the press, and really build a foundation to then come into that rising market financially, product-wise, whatever um, approach you take. Folks, if, if I want you to just replay that in your head. Those are some of the wisest words all of you can hear because, you know, everybody looks at recessions, the media and everything, and all you'll see is negative, negative, negative. Shut the news off and realize that Whatever this is that's about to happen, and when it does, nobody can time it, but when it does happen, I want you to all to understand what he just said. It will single-handedly be the biggest opportunity for some of you of your lifetime, hands down. So if you got this idea, this company, this thing that will solve massive problems, much like Peter's company that we're going to get into next, if it solves a big problem, there is no better time to build that company than a downward cycle because you will have attention. People will pay attention. People will watch what you're doing because you'll be the light in the darkness. When everybody else is stuck in the darkness and some, too many actually, will bury their head in the sand and just pretend, ah, oh, it's just going to blow over. Well, that blow over is not going to be pretty, but you need to be the one that raises the torch and says, folks, follow me. I'll show you through the darkness and carry that torch. Every company that starts in these hard times, usually if they're done for the right reasons and they solve the right problem, turn out to be massive companies. You can look through history and you can you can count them, whether it's Uber or any of the other ones that came out of the Great Recession. Look at them now. They solved the big problem. They were started at a time when people were willing to listen. But the problem is too many people 
wait to the last minute. We, they redline it, right? They wait until, oh, well, I'll make some decisions. I'll start planning when the event happens. You don't understand the markets if that's what you're doing, because the first leg is the worst leg. And this one will be a doozy to the tune of maybe high 40s, 50% drop inside of a few short months. If you think you can react that fast, God bless you. Because I'll tell you, 99.9% .9 of the people cannot. And the ones that will survive are the ones that got ahead of it and did the pre-planning, not the reactive planning. Warren Buffett always says it best. Listen, the man, you know, you can love him or hate him, but he is so simple in, in the way he says things. When others are greedy, be fearful. There's a lot of greed right now, folks. Right. So be fearful. And when others are fearful, I hate to say it, you got to get greedy and you got to do what you've always been dreaming of doing. So that's what you did, Peter. You went out and you started this company. And I really want to focus a lot of the time talking about what it is you do and the problem you solve. Cause there is, there's one thing for certain, any successful company in the world, I don't care how big or how small it is, how new or how old it is. They do one thing and one thing better than anyone else. And that is solve a problem. But the problem you're solving is so relevant for today. And I think, I don't think a lot of people realize how relevant it is, but they're going to soon. Can we just talk about how you arrived on agriculture and yeah. how you just, I, I got to hear this story. Yeah. I mean, so there's a step between for me. Um, 2008, I started a tech company. It was an enterprise software. I went on this crazy six, seven year journey, you know, VC fundraising, Series A, Series B. It was acquired in 2014. And this was happening, you know, during a major downturn and recovery. That's the key. Um, so it's perseverance, it's um, determination, it's, it's ignoring the naysayers. Everybody wants to give you the view that you can't do what you're doing. And that's when you kind of know you're onto something oftentimes, you know. Uh, but, but my agriculture journey, to your question, came at the end of that tech company sale. And this was my realization because I only knew two places. I've been in the Wall Street bubble and I'd been an entrepreneur, you know, seven day weeks, 14, 16 hour days for six years, not looking out of what I was trying to achieve. Um, and so to me, I was like, okay, got to the end of it. It was brutal, absolutely brutal. Every startup story is um, entrepreneurship is turbulent by design if you're going to achieve something at all. And I, you know, it was a single, they call it on Silicon Valley parlance, you know. Um, it was enough money um, once California had taken you know, taxes. <laughs> so so I live in New York, uh, Peter. I don't know if you know that. So we're not uh, too far off. <laughs> no, so, so I'm, I'm quite open about it. You know, the VC took the core of the money in the acquisition, you know, by rights. They they funded it. Thank you for them and their assistance. Me and my founder was like six million bucks. And I'm very open about this because people don't talk about money. Unless oh, you talk don't. about money, you can't learn about money. So I was in California. Between federal state taxes, I lost 52% of that. It's all right, down to 2.9 million. You go out and you buy a Tesla for cash because that's apparently what you do. Um, I followed the pattern. And then I really sat back exhausted and said, okay, how do I make sure I keep this money? Because that is meaningful. Um, a lot of people had a lot of effort and grind to get there. And how can I make this last for my lifetime and a legacy for my kids? And that is when I started this whole, you know, beginning of, okay, how do you keep and grow the money? And I knew the Wall Street answer. Wall Street's going to do what Wall Street's going to do, Chris. You know, you can't, you know, you can't time the market. It's going to do what it's going to do. You can't control it. You don't control your assets. You can diversify, quote, unquote. And, you know, it doesn't matter where you are. It's going to do what it's going to do. And so I started interviewing people. And I don't know about you, Chris, but I get the best, um, boosts in my life direction and success when I ask people questions, yeah. when I find mentors. And I went to four Silicon Valley founders who I was close to, and I said to them, listen, what do you do with your money once you make some um, in your exits? And I then had everybody chasing me. So all these financial advisors chase you, you know? Mine was a sub 50 million acquisition, which means that the big public companies need to say how much it is and but you know they all assume you've got lots of money oh yeah let's i'm getting calls from wells fargo investment advisors and every man and his dog you know they're mostly men ironically saying you know peter let me help you invest it i'm an inside i'm an inside wall street guy i know the game 
Um, but I found a decent group, and, and this is a long speech, but this is really important. As I interviewed probably a dozen people who I respected, Silicon Valley founders, investment bankers, a few people who were kind of entrepreneurial in their pursuits, they gave me this following advice. They said, Peter, we make our money from public and private company stock. And then when we've made that money, we put it into hard assets, real estate, farmland, or agriculture. If all anybody takes away from this call today, it is that. Work your job, build your company, be an entrepreneur. But once you've made that money, put it into hard assets. And, and that's what's given me this journey. Well, Peter, there's an important lesson in that too. And you know, the difference between rich and wealthy. And you just you just described that. You know, there's the there's the mindset of being rich. And that's when you have the Tesla, you have the means to buy the nice clothes and pretty much the things that you want. And you do that because that's just that's the process. That's just what we've been brought up with. But then some of us, not enough of us, but some of us actually then start to ask those really important questions. I've got this money. How do I keep it? And that is the difference between the rich and the wealthy. The wealthy do one thing different. They focus on keeping the money that they've made. And then they focus on how to make that money continue to work for them for the rest of their lives so that they maintain the wealth. Being rich just means you're going to be poor someday. I hate to say that. You may not like that right now. And a lot of people would get very upset and start arguing. And I didn't wear my haters need hug shirt. So we're going to avoid that because they don't believe that, you know, being rich, acting rich, and all the acts that go into it mean that you're going to be poor someday. But I tell you, statistically and history proves it, you will be if you don't change that one thing that you changed. And that is start figuring out how to keep the wealth. So you, you went into hard assets. And went on a real estate investing journey. You always go to people you, you know, know who you trust. Start in single family, that classic journey. I mean, you know, like many people listen to your podcast, they wouldn't be A type players unless they were listening to your podcast. And I bought 21 single family homes in three states because you can't buy them in California. No. Uh, but I was in Texas, Pennsylvania, you know, Pittsburgh. I was in Florida, bought 21 single family homes, uh, 13 for cash, eight mortgaged, and built an amazing portfolio of hard assets that started producing cash flow. And for a couple of years there, I thought I was the king of real estate because <laughs> because I was buying these turnkey <laughs> homes. They were like they were printing money, you know. I, I, I mean, you kind of leverage with that portfolio for these homes because for those of you on the East Coast, New York, ex California, like me, um, you can't in like Texas and Pittsburgh and Florida. You could in those days in 2014, 2016, still buy a three bed, two bath, two car garage home to rent out for a hundred grand. You know, <laughs> I mean. Mythical today as the market cap rates have compressed. But um, so, so here's my here's my journey in single family. Um, it was going great. First year, I was getting 12 grand a month passively. You know, 10 and a half, it dipped a bit. Somebody moved out after a year. Another person moved out. They stole the air conditioner, held three and a half grand gone, all the cash flow for the previous two years. And it just kept snowballing. And my income was so erratic. It was all over the place. Seven grand one month, ten and a half another, and it, and I realized, and you know, I thought I was the king of real estate. Um, I made a massive mistake because when you you should use the family family you know single family rental model to learn how to invest in real estate. Do a couple, get the pattern, get the construct, educate yourself, make a couple of small mistakes with your money. If you manage to survive it then step up to a larger asset class, multifamily and beyond. And so I went through this crazy single family I've got. Now I get it. Need to find the right team. It's all about the people. Did mobile home path, multifamily. Did a couple of my own. Started doing syndications. Um, Short-term rentals, beach, Mexico, Disney World, um, ag. Started traveling the world. And, and I just like went crazy as a full-time investor for three or four years, um, 2016 until the pandemic hit. And... Uh, it was an MBA in hard assets. That's awesome. You know, and, and I, I initially thought we had a lot in common just because of our Wall Street, but that's exactly what I did when I retired and sold my practice. I actually went fully into real estate. 
me and my wife, we started kind of like you, we were flipping lots of houses with the ambitions of having an HGTV show. Then we got the show or the pilot, I should say. And then, you know, during that transition, we started saying, Hey, this flipping thing sucks. It's a lot of work and there's too many uncontrollables. So we started keeping properties, single families, doubles up to quads, and we started renting them out. And the same thing, it's, it's, you feel like a genius when you first get into it and you got them rented until you get some of that turnover, a couple of bad tenants. And we got up to 91 units uh, with our rental portfolio and it was great. We had some bad property managers that pretty much, I don't want to say they stole money, but they found ways to make sure that none was ever left for us, uh, not going there. But uh, then the pandemic hit. And I had been selling off some of the portfolio just to thin out the bad properties. And when the pandemic hit, much like you, I realized that all tenants were going to take advantage of that. And we redlined. So the beauty is, is when it, when it V'd, I thought it was going to keep going, but when it V'd and entered the world that we're in now, real estate values bubbled and went crazy. I've just gone off on a tangent on selling all as many of them as we can. We're down to 14 which I still think is too many, but, you know, we've taken all that money and we just move it through private lending and other investments that we make, which are drastically different than anything I've done in my entire life, but make me a lot happier. And I think that's kind of, uh, and I'm just paralleling. I'm not trying to tell my story, but I'm just trying to say how similar these two are. It's wild. I'm so intrigued by this. So keep going. So where does the pandemic take us? The pandemic takes us to a great realization. So I designed this like robust portfolio. I was in like five or six asset classes. Ironically, I was a um, broad, diversified, hard asset portfolio um, architect. And I wasn't really a deep expert in any of them because I hadn't gone deep enough and focused and been really good. And um, I was more lucky than good. And what's actually happened for me I mean, I'll give some examples. Like I bought a condo in Disney World, Florida. The reasons, 75 million visitors a year, 19 theme parks, short-term rental. It was like a pool, complex, everything. How could this go wrong? Disney shut down the pandemic, went from like making two grand a month to losing 2,600 a month uh, when Florida closed down gatherings of more than 500 people. I mean, I can go on with like my friend's stories of student housing that went south. Hotels, we were being offered hotels for cash, like a $12 million asset for 3 million bucks in cash. Because these families who had, you know, 12 hotels, they were trying to arbitrage. You know, let's cut eight loose to keep the four alive, the the best ones. And and it, it was a mess. And so I think where I personally ended up at the end of this pandemic is I tell people now I've pivoted to hard assets, but more importantly, the hard assets at the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of need. So for those of you who aren't aware, Maslow's hierarchy, it's a triangle, but the bottom is food, shelter, security, water, what we need. At the top, up to self-actualization is what you want. And I think if we focus on the needs with our investment portfolio, um, that's going to be there for a long time. So hospitality... (laughs) You know, it was a want. I want to travel. Hey, you know, it's it's if you stick with the knees, we need a roof over our head. We need to eat. And that's where I've gone after this whole pandemic journey. That's fantastic. Yeah. And, you know, in food and you'd mentioned water and you know, I've never really given a whole lot of thought to water. You know, sometimes I think, you know, we have so many things. And if you ever watched the movie, The Book of Eli, you know, all the things that we we have now. And then if you watch that movie, like they had none of those, they would kill people over getting water. And, you know, I I hope to never see that in my lifetime or, and I hope my daughter never sees that, but you know, you got to think about it, how valuable and how priceless simple things like food and water are right now. We take them for granted. We walk into the supermarket and we buy whatever we want. And most of us can just afford to buy whatever we want, even at these inflated prices. But what if that wasn't the case? What if you couldn't just walk into the grocery store? What if you couldn't just turn your faucet on and get clean, drinkable water? How valuable would those things be to you? Well, I think that's the realization that you had. And I think that's why you've gone deep into it. And gosh, you know, it's it's kind of, you look at the Russia-Ukraine war, you hear the, the, you know, you see the sanctions, which are historically what 
you know, most countries do. They sanction other countries in wartime. But those sanctions have kind of backfired slightly because now we're going to realize that the things that we so need, wheat and, you know, basic things that we take for granted, now we're not going to get them from over there. And they're a major supplier of wheat. So, like, (laughs) when you get to that hierarchy, like, food is definitely a very important one. But how is it that you solve that problem? And how is it that that problem that you solve provides a secondary opportunity for investors of two different classifications, accredited and non-accredited? Well, so let's kind of um, step back and talk about ag. So I think you need to have an, an asset allocation for your wealth. So let's kind of start there. And I don't know, do you have a clear allocation, Chris? You say, you know, I'm in this stock market percent and this and yeah, so very, very clear. And most people telling me I'm crazy for my allocations, but I follow Ray Dalio pretty closely. I've watched his shift in his uh, all weather. I think it's the all weather or all season portfolio. And I've watched how he's gone from heavy stock to now 55% to intermediate and long-term treasuries, which shows clear bearish op, you know, future yeah. projections. So I've adjusted my portfolio suggestions even more drastically than, than Ray has. And but I do I have alternative assets at 15%, but I've never thought of agricultural, even even though I should have, because I mean, listen, Bill Gates, love him, hate him, like he, he's he's buying farmland. And I wonder why. But uh, you know, that that's something that I listen, I'm I'm listening to you talk, not just because I want my audience to hear, but because I'm equally as intrigued and <laughs> interested in this this whole asset class. So yeah, keep going. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's start at asset allocation. I'm glad you have an asset allocation. We're from Wall Street. We know we need an asset allocation. Most people don't. They don't think of it in those terms. And so my asset allocation is 10 to 30% in the stock market for liquidity. At the I'm right at five. Time. I'm now down to 7%, by the way. I'm five. So I've broken my allocation. My next foundation is US multifamily. U.S. dollar, reserve currency, multifamily, um, syndications predominantly. And that is the foundation of my wealth. Because when you pick the right multifamily building in a strong metro area, job growth, population growth, higher medium condo values, declining crime rates, there's data you can use in the due diligence process to make sure you invest your money in the right multifamily assets in the U.S., and it is a spreadsheet. Get the right operator, just turn the crank, put the money in, five, seven years later, go through the cycle, sell the building, get the appreciation. It just works. Mm-hmm. So the next bucket, third bucket, is ag for me because I've now gone the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I've spent the past six years investing in agriculture in many forms on in my investing journey. And the thing I realized was that I didn't want an asset class that was correlated with everything else I had. Because people say, you know, they always say to me, oh, I know ag. It's um, it's like uncorrelated with the stock market. I'm like, no, there's no correlation anywhere. Hmm. You know, Wall Street's going to do what's going to do. You have no control. With your multifamily investments, for instance, or hard real estate in the US, if you educate yourself, approach it from a data-driven analysis and due diligence perspective, stop falling for the glossy marketing brochures or taking a broker friend's advice. Be clean in how you're going to actually invest your money. Uh, And and then I want this asset class, which is not only outside the US, that's where I enter international real estate in the farm and space, but more importantly, I know it doesn't matter. Stock market can crash. Housing markets can cycle. At the end of the day, people still got to eat. And that's where I went because the other piece of advice I got from the original uh, mentors was apart from making your money in public and private company stock and then investing in hard assets, one of these guys, um, he basically said to me, he, you know, he claims he was one of the Zuckerberg's financial advisors. Now, you, you can't verify this stuff. Um, he had a portion of their portfolio. And he said, what you don't realize, Peter, is that High net worth individuals or family offices, they have between 14 and 22% of their wealth in agriculture or forestry products. And the amazing thing um, about that statement is that it it doesn't even hit our radar, does it? Because 14 to 22%. And I was like, well, 
I was like, well, how, why is that? Was the first question. And I said, well, listen, um, you can plant a tree. It can produce a crop. If it's a permanent crop like coconuts, limes. And in four years, it starts producing. Eight years, it gets the max production. In the case of a coconut tree, it will produce for 60 to 80 years straight. So they're doing it because it not only is giving them um, hard asset that protects their money, but gives them cash flow in their lifetime, but it passes down to their heirs in their future um, wealth profile. And that's why they do it. Oh, that's fantastic. Pretty ironic that you just said that because, you know, in my office, my, my little one never comes and visits. And as you're telling that story, my little daughter, 22 months old, walks in and you're teaching her all about how legacy is created. Did you hear that, Vivi? So, yeah, it was just a few things. She's She never comes into the office and uh, she just strolls right in at, during this podcast. So I figured I'd I'd bring her on the show and have her say hello. Say hi, Vivi. Say hi. <laughs> She's shy. She's shy. <laughs> Beautiful. So a, as we're talking about that, you know, the other thing too, you know, with, with, it's just an amazing investment opportunity, but you know, not every, a lot of times when something's so good and it's so needed, a lot of people think, oh, I could never invest in that, but, but you've made it available to people. I mean, yes, accredited investors, syndications, private funds and all this stuff. That's great. But so many people, when they look at the, the qualifications to be called an accredited investor, they don't qualify, but you've made it available to non-accredited investors, which is rare. Can you just tell me, cause that also opens up a whole bunch of, uh, different paperwork and additional fees and costs and just a, well, to me, I've, I've had a reggae fund one and I don't know if I'll ever do another one. It's, it's more difficult. So why did you do that? Um, well, listen, I'm, I won't go into detailed products today because they will change. Um, we're, what we're seeing, Chris, and you'll appreciate this is that we're seeing the financialization of everything happen right now, which means, you know, the classic example is, you know, um, you can buy into an art it worked fractionalized, you know, $100, $500, $1,000, and, and gain access to asset class through tokenization. Um, and so let's kind of rather than focus on today's product, let's talk about the fact that I think blockchain tokenization and the financialization of everything is giving a lot of people who never had access to these assets before because they weren't accredited the ability to finally start playing with those asset classes. Now, does that come with risk in certain cases? Absolutely. Um, and so I keep coming back around and saying, listen, agriculture, approach it like you would multifamily, like you would um, you know, a short-term rental portfolio. Understand what the important data points are. Understand what the due diligence process should be and follow through and educate yourself um, on that asset class. See if it's, see if it's perfect for you. And so I, I kind of like, you know, when you think about multifamily, you're looking for that population growth. You're looking for higher house condo values over 20 years. You're looking for the lower crime rates. There's a corollary of data in the agricultural space. So you want to know what the crop is. You want to know, okay, what's the demand for the crop? Is the demand increasing? Avocados, classic, you know? They can't get enough harsh avocados in the world. Might it be overplanted one day? Absolutely. Um, you know, but it, it's still not um, satisfying demand. Uh, you kind of look at the crop, you look at logistics, you know, what's the shelf life? Believe you me, I'd rather invest in a coconut farm with an incredibly hardy crop, which can survive long drought periods. It can survive long shelf life periods. You know, it takes 11 months from a flower for the coconut to be um, consumable from a water or meat perspective or processed. Um, and then you have another, you know, six, 12 months, depending on what you product you bring into, um, to actually get it to the shelf and uh, get it consumed, depending on the product you're after. So you've got to look at the crop, you've got to look at the location, the weather pattern. You know, instead of worrying about house condo values, instead of worrying about crime rates, how about you look at the soil quality? How about you look at the sunshine, the weather, climate pattern? How about you look at the water and rainfall where the place where your farm is? And so I tell people, you know, go and get educated, understand the asset class, understand what the due diligence process is and the areas of focus you need to look into from a data perspective to work out 
what makes sense for agricultural assets in your portfolio with your risk tolerance. Nothing is risk-free. You're just swapping one set of risks for another uh, based upon your personal preference around your tolerance for risk. Yeah, it's it's interesting, you know, all that you talk about risk versus reward and you're really doing the due diligence uh, in the book that I'm writing for my daughter about these six laws of wealth. Law number three is protect your wealth. And then it goes on to say, invest in things, you know, like and understand your entire story was you invested in things you started to know you liked and you understood. And then it also goes on to say, invest with people that have the knowledge through time, wisdom and failure. And that's yeah. exactly what you were just explaining. So, I mean, investing is quite simple when you break it down to the pure laws of investing, instead of looking at, oh, you know, all the, the speculation and all the glossy brochures, as you said, and boy, there's lots of them out there today. And you just get down to the fundamentals of, of why we invest and what we invest in. But, you know, for everybody watching this, just really look at your risk profile and what you're, you're looking from a reward. And remember, don't be unrealistic with that. And then start to understand it or find somebody that truly understands it. Like Peter, who, who has created this entire company out of these laws, you know, whether or not he knows the laws or not, he, it doesn't matter whether you know them or not. If you follow them, the the path is imminent. It's always going to be success because they're just laws. So I love it. And I, and I love what, how you did that with the, you know, the, the tokening tokenization, I think is how you explained it. I'm new to that. I, gosh, I'm not even that old. I'm 44, but I'm just, that whole world is just starting to, it's so vast and so different from everything I know that I've just struggled to kind of really embrace it. But the more uses I see of it, the more I start to understand how it can be used to solve simple problems. And that's exactly what you're doing. I love it. I love it. So, so you'll see agricultural models out there domestically, internationally. You'll see accredited, you know, 506C, B, the usual private placement stuff. You'll see some real estate plays where you're buying the land with a certain number of trees, a certain amount of harvest income. Um, and you'll see, you know, the usual public market stuff and everything in between. And tokenization is becoming um, more uh, to the fore. Now, the funny thing is, is, is Chris, is that, you know, the regulators are on the back foot. It's going to take them three, five, seven, ten years to catch up to the innovation that is happening in the financialization of everything. Um, so again, think about the future. Um, think about that angle to it. Um, and based upon your asset, you know, allocation based upon your wealth amount, you know, never put more than 10% in any one investment, never, never, never. Um, And just be prudent, you know, spread it across two or three areas that you're competent in, that you've been educated in, that you've found the best teams to your point and uh, and grow it steadily. If it's get rich quick to your point earlier, um, you can lose your capital. And so it's, uh, it's, there are just some golden rules um, that you shouldn't forget because financialization is happening everywhere. And I, I would I would argue the biggest um, problem in today's world is our ability to market has outpaced our ability to, um, let's say, um, <laughs> innovate from a product standpoint. I agree with that completely. Like we've gotten so evolved on one side, the other side hasn't caught up. And, and I think like you said, with the, the tokenization, like, yeah, the, the SEC and the, the governing bodies, boy, it's going to take them a while. They still call them collectibles, you know, with the NFTs yeah. and everything else. Like, you know, if you got a self-directed IRA, you know, they don't even want you to have, you know, collectibles in there. So they've, they found unique ways to exclude people from doing this just simply because they haven't caught up. That's all it, it will mark my word when they figure out how to tax it and how to put it into the, you know, all the little boxes that they have to fit, then it'll, it'll just be business as usual, but it might take some time. And the opportunity is probably going to be from now until they actually figure it out. That's where the ultimate opportunity will be. And you're seizing that opportunity. I love it. And I just yeah. love the the problem you're solving. I mean, I said that offline before we even started, you know, I read a lot of your stuff prior to doing this podcast. And the biggest thing I honed in on is just this massive problem that you're solving and then how you're actually solving two problems at the same time. And I, I think it's fantastic. And I appreciate everything you're doing. And I hope all of you that are listening to this episode really, really have learned some things because 
this is pure wisdom that you're hearing, folks. This is a journey through of realization by learning from people much smarter than than myself, much smarter than Peter, much smarter than all of you. And in this learning journey, you can cut that that process down for you. If you just listen and apply these simple things in your life without having to, you know, learn the hard lessons that maybe me and Peter have, or so many others, you can get there much quicker. And that's the beauty of wisdom. The problem is, is so few people actually use and apply the wisdom. So that's the most important thing. And folks, like if you were even remotely interested in what Peter's company does, Farm Folio, you have to look at it. We'll put the description in the, the link or the links in the description so you guys can click it, check it, do your due diligence. If it's something you know, like, and understand, move forward with it. Or if it's something that you think Peter has the wisdom, the knowledge, and the ability to take your money and your need where it needs to go, then then do that. And always, always like, I love that you said the 10% rule. It's, it's just a golden rule, but too few yeah. people ever follow that. So in, in closing, I, I would ask you one question. What on this awesome journey that you've been on, what's been your biggest internal obstacle that you've had to face? Um, my, my solution to my biggest obstacle is the fourth bucket of my asset allocation. Stock market, multifamily in the US, ag overseas, all very different, all non-correlated. I have an overactive mind. I want to mess with my wealth building techniques in the multifamily and finance space and play with it. And you know, you've got to leave it there for five, seven, 10 years. This isn't get rich quick. Leave it there. So what I do is I allocate between five to seven percent of my portfolio, my wealth. And I invest in crazy stuff, blockchain, you know, currency trades. I do, you know, biotech. I do that to distract myself, to keep my brain in new things and new learning so I don't touch the core investment strategies in the other buckets. And so depending on your personality, don't be your own worst enemy by trying to undo the goodness of setting up a long-term portfolio, find that small amount, experiment, throw into real, you know, stuff that you just don't know where it's going to head, and uh, and you'll probably do better long-term than if you hadn't done that. I agree. Wealth is a marathon, folks. It's not a sprint. Just like life is also a marathon. Don't make it a sprint. You'll look back someday and say, boy, I wish I would have just stopped and smelled the roses. Investing is very similar. Stop and smell the roses on your investing journey. Find things that you really enjoy. And I know I'm intrigued. Farm Folio will absolutely be a piece of my alternative investment portfolio strategy. And I think it should fit in all of yours. So folks, I hope you guys enjoyed this, Peter. I certainly have. It's been a real pleasure and a real honor to get to know you, learn about your journey and hear about what you're doing. And I would just say, keep doing it and keep helping solve big problems. I appreciate it. Um, go to the website, download Farmland 101, download the Ag Investor Guide, educate yourself. That's all I ask. Um, education is the key to life. And thank you, Chris, for doing the podcast, for helping educate me and many others out there. Because without you doing what you were doing, we wouldn't be better investors overall. I appreciate it. And folks, we're going to put all those links in the description. So as you listen to this, if this is something you want to learn more about, and I think you absolutely should, click the links, begin your education journey into this, and then take action. It's the most important thing. Knowledge is only so, it only gets you so far. It's the application of the knowledge that will really get you where you want to be in life. And that's exactly what you've done, Peter. So thank you. And folks, we will see you all on the next episode. Thanks for spending the time with us today. Have a blessed day. Go out there and take some action.